Hi guys, it's Dr. Eric Lindquist, CEO and founder of Sonopath.com, and I'd like to invite you to pass through your surgical or commuting day in veterinary medicine by listening to our podcast, Real Talk in Veterinary Medicine from experienced professionals who aren't afraid to tell you how things really are so you can optimize your veterinary career and your process. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Eric Lindquist from Sonopath. Uh, we were talking about the cost of missing a lesion and we put this podcast together to help you navigate through all of the issues that come up with the discussion of clinical sonography from buying capital equipment to who is going to scan, how to scan, techniques employed, um, education behind it all. These are all important things and, and we were talking about maximizing the image quality as a core part of what you do uh, from a diagnostic standpoint and even from a marketing standpoint because the image quality is a core part of the marketing of your ultrasound service and the seriousness around it. If you're projecting the reputation of you and your facility with poorly optimized images, that reflects a poor seriousness of process. And, and, you're, and, it, and it doesn't get looked upon well um, it, when interrogated by colleagues uh, or even telemedicine specialists. So optimized images project deliberate, uh, definitive professionalism of process that reflects you and your facility as an entity. So you can make an argument to pull part of your marketing budget for your facility and put it into the quality of your ultrasound and your clinical sonography process because fine images and fine reports automatically market what you do, but the most important marketing concept of clinical sonography is get the answer as fast as possible and as efficiently as possible and ensure that it is the correct answer to put that animal in that 12 to 24 hour diagnostic rule that we talk about, to get the animal going th into the uh, realm of therapy that it needs as fast as possible. So. Now, today in the second part of the cost of missing a lesion, we're going to go bullet point concepts, subject by subject. So these are the most important uh, concepts to address when you're dealing with clinical sonography. And you can apply a lot of this to any capital equipment, whether it's a DR system or especially CT nowadays. Um, the, the advances in CT, especially volumetric CT that are out there are pretty amazing uh, and you'll see that coming down, uh, coming down the pike here in veterinary medicine uh, rapidly and expansively. So you may want to keep a lookout for that. But combining CT with ultrasound is an amazing tool and if you package it correctly with the workup, your, your results are going to be amazing. Not everybody of course can afford a CT, but just realize that 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 technology and that combination is coming and we'll be talking about it in the future. With regards to ultrasound machines and clinical sonography, dealing with concepts by subject. The first subject of course is your machine selection. Okay, Plan to spend around thirty-five to fifty thousand dollars or more for an ultrasound machine to do full body scanning. If you're doing fast scanning, yeah you can drop it down, you can get the small handheld units if need be, but realize it's a get what you pay for scenario. This may sound like a daunting number at first, but it really isn't. Uh, when you look at the ROI, return on investment of a properly purchased machine that is employed properly in veterinary medicine, the numbers take care of themselves very quickly and we're going to take a look at that here in a minute. But I'll explain what I've seen over and learned over the last 25 to 30 years in the industry. We're not talking about fast scanning here at 35 to 50K. You can, of course, do fast scanning with those and you'll have a higher resolution and you can, you can bridge your current fast scanning with a 35 to $50,000 machine into full scanning, which we've seen that happen. It works really well because you're already used to the knobology and you're used to the concept of ultrasound by fast scanning and transitioning it into full sonography. Is a, is a fairly seamless process. Um, but we're talking here about a machine that if it's sick, it needs a probe type clinical sonography with every point in the abdomen, heart, chest, small parts, everything imaged with one machine. 
whether you're doing a stifle or a parathyroid or a liver tumor or a PDA in the heart, one machine should be able to do it all. This is a mentality that is essential first and foremost before considering purchasing an ultrasound machine. If you don't adopt this mentality of purchasing an adequately functional machine for every type of scanning, then there's a much higher chance of being on the wrong end of a missed lesion. You develop your own cost of missing a lesion. This thirty-five dollars to $50,000 price range I describe as the best of good enough investment. This, of course, isn't a standalone unit, which, you know, if you can spend 90 grand on a machine that, you know, maybe a university radiologist would have or something like that, where <clears throat> it images everything with very little effort, then great. <laughs> spend that amount. Absolutely. I encourage that. If you can, if that works in your ROI, that's what you want to do. You have the ability to do that, then you'll enjoy becoming a da Vinci of sonography. And I will envy you personally, but I have scanned mostly in mobile settings and therefore my expertise lies in the primarily the best mobile machine for your money, you know, and this is in the 35 to 50 K range. And this has always been 35 to 50 K since I started scanning. It was always 35 to 50 K with a Toshiba just vision back in 1998, you know, it was 35 to 50 K, you know, it's always in that range when you're talking about the best of good enough category, right? So, Obviously, the, the range of 3550K depends on probe configuration. Are you getting a three probe system, a four probe system, a five probe system? You should have a machine that is plug and play and has all the software you need to scan cardiac, abdomen, small parts. Uh, be careful about buying a machine for abdomen and then you have to upgrade to cardiac and then you find out you have to spend five to $10,000 on software to do cardiac, as opposed to just plugging in a cardiac probe that you purchase. You know, sometimes you scale up from abdomen to chest, and then you, you buy a phased array cardiac probe, maybe two of them, to cover the full spectrum. And you should just be able to plug and play with that. So, so it's important to proactively look at what you want to do in the future of buying your machine. So make sure that the machine you purchase, say, hey, if I want to do cardiac, what's it take? Do I have the software for it? The answer should be yes and you should just be able to buy the probe. And unfortunately, there are vendors out there that make you pay extra for software after the fact. You know, so you've been scanning for six months or a year in the abdomen and now you wanna to go to cardiac and then boom, you find yourself with five grand per probe or three to five grand per probe, or maybe you can go on eBay and get something cheaper to just add on. Um, but then you find out you don't have software for it and they charge you three to five grand for the software. You know, and so boom, you're, you're rapidly into an additional ten to fifteen thousand dollars in a couple of probes and software, in addition to the machine that you just bought, or you bought six months ago, or a year ago, or two years ago. So be careful about that, and proactively ask that right question, right, and make sure you're not going to have surprises when you want to upgrade your probe configuration. So. If assuming the machine is priced conscientiously and that your 35 to 50 K machine is truly a 35 to 50 K machine, and that's just, that's just, uh, you know, check on social media with mobile ultrasound groups or check with friends and check your local mobile sonographer and see what he or she uses because they're using it every day, you know, check with them and see, you know, what's the right price for this machine that I'm looking at. Right. Uh, but assuming that all pricing is conscientiously done, and uh, with respect to quality and clinical support of the machine, you should buy image resolution that defines curvilinear patterns and contrasting tissue presentations first and foremost. You have to be able to see the lines between the organ systems when you're imaging, okay? And if you're not, that software may not be for you. Everybody's eye sees things differently. I personally, in my circles, we like to see a little more of a contrast image so we can follow curvilinear patterns from the pancreatic duct and pancreatic capsule and differentiate it readily from surrounding mesentery, right? You need to have adequate probes. So, and frequencies and resolution for every presentation. So if your settings are incorrect or if the software is not 
is not doesn't have enough contrast to it everything is going to blend in and so your mesentery around the pancreas is going to make everything look like pancreatitis so you're going to over diagnose pancreatitis when it's not there and we see this with a variety of machines so you, you have to make sure that you can follow curvilinear patterns and you have presets associated with each probe for that presentation you need a lower res lower frequency probe for bigger animals is something in the three megahertz or four megahertz and you need a high frequency probe uh, it, that is going to adequately penetrate to four centimeters or so for cats if you want or or if you want to look at bowel for mucosal striations so usually you're going to want a microconvex probe that's going to pretty much do 70 80 percent of your scans and then you're going a lot of a low frequency probe so your your spectrum is going to be from like three to five three to six megahertz probe for the larger animals and then you're going to have a oh five to ten megahertz microconvex probe that'll handle everything up to 70 pounds or so you know but that's only part the frequency is only part of the problem you have to have the acoustic power of the machine to be able to penetrate the tissues to get to 10 to 12 to 14 centimeters of depth in, your, in these animals. And if you don't have that acoustic power, then the probe frequency is only one factor. It's only going to get you so far. You know, so you have to have the power of penetration. That usually goes with the size of the box that you're buying. Not always but it usually does so if the machine is really small the chances are the acoustic power is inadequate or not what a larger box is going to be because that's usually a hardware issue right and so you have to spend for the hardware to be able to penetrate the deep tissues and so this is why the rubber hits the road with 50 to 60 pounds and tense abdomens and thick skin and all these other things that impede acoustic penetration right and so that's why you always need to scan from a thin cat all the way up to 120, 130 pound mastiff, right? And and or a Rottweiler. Something about Rottweilers are always challenging, right? So, so both demeanor and body score, you know. So so it's important to to be able to test all of these body types before you make a decision. All right. Um, other things to look at are uh, workflow optimization right your workflow everybody forgets about workflow you know i personally don't like uh don't like uh touch screens they're, they're, that I, I i don't want i want to be able to feel the buttons and move on through right and you should you want to look at the minimal amount of steps that it takes you to get through your case right and some machines it'll be five seven eight steps others will be three or four steps you know so you multiply that by all the scans you're going to do every month and it ends up taking up a lot of time depending on how the design of the workflow is for the machine Optimize screen size and resolution, very important. You want to be able to, the screen resolution also plays a big role in you recognizing the lesions that are present. Consistent transmissibility of image sets in proper contained file size and minimal steps. Everybody forgets about this. You have to be able to scan a case, do a full abdomen, an S-step or similar, and move that case across the internet to your to either yourself or through an internet provider your, your telemedicine provider as a test case and find out what's the file size on your end what's the file size on their end how long did it take you to transmit how easy was it how many steps were did it take these are important because these are things that you or your technician are going to do with every case right so you don't want you know, three gigabyte or two gigabyte or even a gigabyte and a half size files that you have to move around all day. You know, so when when I had to purchase machines and multiple machines, nine machines for the field, I had to switch from the prior machine that I was using because the software would amplify amplify the file sizes. And and I imagine if I've got nine sonographers in the field moving cases across the internet all day long at five to ten apiece. You can't have one or two or three gigabyte file sizes. It's just not going to work, right? It should your file size should be around 500 megabytes, or roughly. You know, more com a little bit bigger and more complicated cases. So these factors vary greatly from manufacturer to manufacturer, and it's you. It's in your in your sonographer's best interest to test all of these factors because they translate into lost time, which is lost economic revenue. If you're if the person who's making the final decision is what we call bean counters, right? They, they're, they're focused on making sure that the margins are solid and all the rest. What is your time translate into? Right. If you're spending more time per case on all of these factors, 
then that translates into lost revenue because your time, your technician's time, calculate it by how many minutes you're gonna lose between one workflow or the other, and it translates into a ton of lost revenue. You know, So these are factors that it seem nebulous, but they're actually, when you go and calculate them out, they make a big difference, especially over a year's time. And of course, you know, you're gonna be less frustrated with a more, uh, more inline workflow, right? So again, all these factors are very important uh, to test on patient sizes, confirmations, body scores, presets, and workflow, both during your scan and the transmissibility of it. If you're not optimizing all of these factors, you're going to be struggling to find the lesions. You're going to, that you're going to be struggling to find that common bile duct and differentiate it from the portal vein, or you're going to miss the sludge in the common bile duct. You're going to miss irregularities in a cat pancreas that are causing pancreatitis. You can have a minor, minor one centimeter or a half centimeter lesion in a cat that is causing the whole clinical issue, right? So these are your risks of, min uh, of missing lesions. Imagine the right adrenal. You, you know, if you can't see that right adrenal, you don't have acoustic power to penetrate, you know, seven, eight, nine centimeters into a tense abdomen, uh, then you're gonna miss that right adrenal tumor, you know, that's eating into the frontic vein and going into the vena cava. You're gonna miss steps in the telemedicine transmission. You're gonna have to repeat transmissions if, you're, if your file size is too big and it gets hung up because your, inter, uh, your internet infrastructure or your internet connectivity can't handle a file size and it drops off. You know, these are all things that we run into on a daily basis. These are not isolated scenarios, right? Um, so imagine your frustrated technician or yourself, if you're sending the cases out yourself, you should be having a tech or an assistant do it. But imagine their time lost if they're trying to push a big file across the internet and they get pulled from all their other duties. That is frustrating. You know how important techs are in their time and to be able to get things done in a clinic, right? So th these are all things that we run into constantly. Software glitches, right? Software glitches. I, I, I've been fighting software glitches my entire sonographer life. And, and it's important to really try to, when you get a, tr a machine trial for a week, run the heck out of that machine on everything that you can. Every body score you can, every heart, abdomen, thyroid, parathyroid, is the orthopedic ultrasound if you're doing that. Run it hard. And, and try to get at least 20 cases done on that machine before you really get a feel for it. Um, and otherwise, you're not doing your time justice and you're not doing your future time justice because you risk making a bad choice on a machine that you didn't adequately trial, right? And you shouldn't keep it more than a week because then that puts miles on the, on the machine and all the rest, that's not fair to the distributor. But Drive it hard when you have it. If you have it for five days, schedule everything you can. Scan the same animal, you know, 20 times if you have to. But, but really drive it and get a feel for it because you're going to be living with that, that machine for at least the next five to eight years, right? So um, it's best to prevent these issues as opposed to trying to cure the problems, right? So it's best to prevent these issues by adequately testing out machines, right? As, as opposed to trying to cure the problems after you buy a machine at 20 to 30,000, expecting it to do all the things that I'm talking about, which you'll need to do in clinics, right? On every case. And, and those machines are often marketed as good enough or just as good as the ones that are sold higher, right? Well, why are they being sold at 20 to 30K if they're just as good to 35 to 40 to 50K, right? It, it's, it, it's really, Ask yourself that question, right? They have to, the manufacturer and distributor has to save money somewhere to drop it $15,000, right? So, and that's usually hardware and that usually translates into acoustic penetration, that usually translates into R&D, that usually translates into support cost, that usually translates into the time they, they spent, or no time at all, on creating the presets, right? So everything has a number attached to it that goes into the price. So no matter how things are marketed, it is typically a get what you pay for scenario. And you can overpay for lesser machines. It's really tough that you underpay for better machines. 
So if purchasing from a clinically oriented company, you'll have the proper clinical support, you'll have optimized presets, you'll have extensive, extensively tested machines for all body types and structure to image, structures that you need to image. So instruction on which probe to use and which presentation, how to optimize that, um, and all of this translates into one, getting the diagnosis and minimize your cost of missing a lesion because the chance of missing a lesion is less and less and less the more you pay attention to all these factors. And in addition, your report looks better because your images are prettier and you have a finer calling card that represents you properly, right? So consider this quick economic uh, exercise over five to eight year life time of an ultrasound machine. If we just talk economics and painfully eliminate image quality for a moment, right? Which I quiver when I do, <laughs> but image quality is so important. However, I'm just from a bean counting standpoint, I'm gonna eliminate image quality and just talk numbers. So take this simple calculation and then have a tax break discussion with your accountant. Right now I'm recording this and we're in Q4, so everybody's talking about end of year tax breaks, right? You need to invest into ultrasound and other capital equipment so you get a tax break at the end of the year and give less to Uncle Sam. Okay, I get that, absolutely. Well, if you take a five ultrasound examinations per week practice, and this is extremely conservative, at $350 to $400 owner cost per scan, which is the minimal any number of or any any uh, minimal number of ultrasounds should be done at any facility, even a one doctor practice, a $15,000 machine is paid for in roughly three to four months. But are you going to get how many lesions are you going to miss with that? Right? Just try to scan a 70 pound dog with a 15k machine. You're going to have trouble, and then don't even talk about a hundred pounder or even a mastiff right? A $35,000 machine is going to be paid for in six months. If you're scanning five scans a week at a $350, $400 owner cost, or a $45,000 machine is going to be paid in eight to nine months. So it pays for itself within the first year on just really conservative numbers. So there's essentially no economic reason to purchase, to not purchase the best possible machine you can to avoid your cost of missing a lesion. Because what does it cost you when you miss a lesion and the place down the street nails it? You miss that right adrenal nodule that was actually a tumor because you didn't have acoustic power resolution for it. And you thought you got it, you swept through it, but you only got the caudal pole, but they got the cranial pole and they found the invasive adrenal tumor of the pheochromocytoma. This is not a rare occurrence. Do you wanna be on the other end of that conversation? I know I don't, I have been, and, and that's why I'm doing this, that's why I'm doing this podcast, so you don't have to be on the end of that conversation. You wanna be on the positive end of that conversation and doing everything you can to protect your colleague that missed the first one, right? And playing the high road, because that's what we do now when you minimize your cost of missing a lesion. You wanna be on the right side of that conversation. So just do the math, and and high quality imaging footprint accuracy cost very small difference from a just as good or good enough machine that costs $25,000 or less. Be sure to do your true math calculating your average exam price per patient. Your sonographer cost, what's it cost for 15 minutes of a sonographer scan? Because you should not be scanning more than 15 minutes to do a full abdomen from deep pelvic urethra to common bile duct pylorus and right adrenal. You should not. If you're taking longer than that, you need to look at a better mousetrap on how you are scanning. Because everybody in my circles, all of our technicians are scanning maximum 15 minutes and those are the complicated cases. You should be at 10 minutes on average from urethra to gastroesophageal inlet to right adrenal gland and everything in between. What's your tech cost holding the patient for those 15 minutes and five to 10 minutes to process and send the image set to telemedicine or archive it or whatever. Sum these costs together, do your math. Because if you have an administrator that, that, that has to make the final decision on the economics of your machine, then they will be impressed that you did the math and you know the economics behind the ultrasound machine that you want to purchase. Sum these costs, these inherent costs, from your ultra charge, ultrasound charge to the owner and you'll realize 45K goes away very fast. And if you're 
utilizing if it's sick it needs a probe and just practicing good efficient diagnostic efficiency medicine then that number goes away very quickly remember i was telling you that even when back in 1998 or so when i, I purchased my or my practice purchase the first ultrasound machine just Justin uh, just vision toshiba just vision it was like 35 to 50k you know with the full probe configuration do everything i mean and obviously the image quality was out in 1998 but it was still 35 to 50k i had that machine paid for just ultrasound not all the ancillary stuff and biopsies and aspirates all that, just ultrasound within six months you know and and so but that was in a that was in a two and a half doctor practice we practiced if it's sick it needed a probe and we practiced really well and we got to the bottom of stuff and the numbers took care of themselves so if it's sick, it needs a probe should be the representative core to your process. And then the numbers are just a non-factor at that point. In other words, do clinical sonography correctly at the beginning and the economics are in your favor and will also grow and propagate and foster adjacent or, uh, 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 adjunctive procedures in your facility. So, you know, you have them on light sedation. Well, maybe you go and get into that ear canal and look at it because he's had a chronic ear infection, see what's really going on. Or maybe you do a quick dental or maybe you do a quick tumor removal or, or something along those lines, right? It's truly a forest versus tree scenario. And, and I really despise the tradition of, oh, I'm just getting into ultrasound, so I'm just gonna buy a $15,000 machine. No, you're gonna miss it. If you're gonna get into it, get into it. Get in, dive in, train, do what you need to, because you're going to trip up in the process, you're gonna get frustrated, or you're gonna miss lesions. Get a machine that you can see everything right from the beginning. Because if you're doing a scan without seeing the adrenal glands, there's gonna be adrenal pathology. It happens all day long. We see it on telemedicine, adrenal pathology over and over and over again, no matter what the clinical signs are. So you're going to miss things. Don't do yourself and the system a disservice by buying a lesser machine because you're just quote unquote getting into ultrasound. Buy a proper machine, do it right. Okay, do it right, do yourself a favor. This is a tough love discussion, but I'm giving it to you for 30 years of experience of seeing what I've seen, you know, and it, and it repeats over and over again. If you're not doing, if you're not going to invest properly in yourself and into the, into the process here of if it's sick and needs a probe and a 35 to 50 K machine, imagine you miss a few lesions. Let's say you do it less. Maybe you don't employ yourself or your tech doesn't employ your doctor doesn't employ him or, him or herself adequately in the learning process. You have a lesser machine that won't penetrate acoustically for more than, you know, diagnostically more than six centimeters, you know, and you get a dog over 50 pounds or you miss a lesion, then it goes somewhere else for a second or third opinion. Then what happens is if you're on the first side of a correct second or third opinion, what happens to your facility? What happens to the confidence within your facility of your colleagues referring you ultrasound? Or even the front office talking about ultrasound. They don't want to talk about ultrasound anymore because they, they don't want the lesion to be missed. Or if you have a referral network, they're not going to, if they, they, you know, word travels fast in veterinary medicine, right? And, and everybody knows you missed something. And, 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 and unfortunately, nobody talks about it, but they all know. So, now you spent 30 grand or 20 grand on a lesser machine, and now you have a, an expensive fast scanning machine or a cystocentesis getter. You know, and, and so that's, that's what happens over and over again. How many clinics do you know have that machine sitting there collecting dust that they tried ultrasound by buying a lesser machine? It's their cost of missing a lesion. Okay, so bring that to your administrator that has to count the numbers and look at the profitability. There's a huge loss. There's a twenty to thirty thousand dollar loss if you don't functionally utilize the machine to the process that's prescribed, right? So you go through it three or four months, a few trips in it, maybe life gets in the way a little bit, and the process just doesn't go any further. Now you have a really expensive dust collector, and and that just costs you twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Sonographer selection. So the sonographer title behind the probe discussion comes up very frequently in our clinical scenarios. Do we need a boarded specialist to do the scan or does it have to be a veterinarian to perform the scan or can it be a technician 
you know, and or maybe it's an RDMS, a registered diagnostic medical sonographer from the human field that's brought over into veterinary, which is a, a very powerful tool when done correctly. Remember, image acquisition and image interpretation are two vastly different concepts, right? Interpretation depends on optimal, complete image acquisition. So one's dependent on the other. And the title matters in the, matters in the interpretation for the most part, but it matters little in the image acquisition. And we've proven that with one of our studies, vet rad and ultrasound. And, and so, the ability to drive the probe and learn to perform optimized and complete image sets is the depends on the individual and the ability of the individual because it's just maneuvers, right? Largely, it's three maneuvers. It's a twist, it's a tilt, it's a slide and following a protocol and image optimization, you know? And that's the difference between a technician scanning and a veterinarian scanning. The technician is just trying to optimize images where the veterinarian is super cognitively moving through the clinical scenario and looks at a, you know, a little right adrenal gland, which happens all the time in dogs, especially in Shih Tzus, and, and it likely just hyperplasia, but they're thinking pheochromocytoma and running down that rabbit hole right away, right? And, and so, whereas technicians just want to image that right adrenal nodule and the right phrenic vein in the vena cava, make sure it's not invading into it and make sure that they're solid with the image set, right? So we see this as interpreting specialists all the time because we get a wide variety from boarded specialists sending in cases to the veterinary technicians that have been trained in the SDEP protocol or similar and, and veterinarians of all types and all abilities sending in. And we all try to make them, try to you know, put them on the right road to improve and continually, but there are all different personalities that drive the probe and all different titles behind the name that drive the probe. And there are fine representations of no title or just technician title and poor representations of even specialist titles, you know, or vice versa. You know, so it just doesn't, you have to remember that image acquisition is a manuality, right? Image interpretation, whole different bulk, right? And so it's a matter of, I mean, I, I still struggle on occasion with interpretations after 200,000 plus cases that I've seen in my career. You know, and so they, there's, there's always a vast, it's an infinity concept as far as what's gonna come across the probe and how to interpret it. Remember that, let's take the RDMS model, the human sonographers. They go through the two to four year program and all they're learning is image acquisition on ultrasound. The physics behind it, how to optimize images, how to maximize protocols. Well, we're taking the veterinary field in any level, whether it's boarded radiologist, internist, cardiologist, and GP veterinarian and veterinary technician and trying to funnel as much of that need to know information that an RDMS would have into their daily protocol. So it's a completely different scenario. Um, then, and, and you have to have an individual that is ready to take those core concepts and apply them on a daily basis to acquire great images that can be interpreted, interpreted well. And the, the title of that person, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but it's less important than it was in the past. And uh, you can look at our recent double-blinded study on vet rad and ultrasound um, this last year on uh, Lindquist et al. Vet rad and ultrasound, you'll find it there. But um, we showed that a summary is that the veterinary technicians, three veterinary technicians, three GPs that have been scanning a long time, and three specialists, two of which were radiologists. We all scan the same animals, same amount of time frame, same machine, same everything. And then double blinded, all the image sets were sent to uh, two boarded radiologists that were blinded to who scanned what. And the categories came out and, and all the images were graded from adrenals to pelvic urethra to common bile duct, the pancreas, every, everything in the abdomen from diaphragm to actin, deep pelvis, back to deep pelvis. And uh, there was no significant difference in image quality between a technician that has been scanning a year and a half to a boarded radiologist that's been scanning for almost 40 years. You know, and so that is an image acquisition concept, right? And it, it was done with a small cat, small, or a cat, small dog, medium dog, large dog. And uh, so obviously 
the defects of that were there was there weren't any pathologies or there was there's some minor pathology in one animal but you throw a bunch of pathological situations in there and you know things may vary but i doubt it because typically the tech everybody is taught in most protocols to adapt to pathology that's there and we teach to image that abnormal structure from four different angles to see what's going into and what's coming out of the structure. So, but it, it was a great a groundbreaking uh, a study that we were very, we were very proud of. Um, education, segueing into education, choose the educational venue best for you and for your workflow and for your goals. How much time do you have to get up to speed to be able to scan right away? When's your machine showing up? The second it shows up, you should be on that thing, learning everything about it and working it into your workflow constantly. Which program will get you up to 15 minute scans or less in the abdomen or in the heart? With practice, focus, and drive, it shouldn't take you long, longer than 15 minutes. And on average, more like 10 or even five minutes if you focus and train to do rapid sonograms. The STEP protocol is what I'm talking about, but they're, you know, I'm sure there are equivalents out there. And emergency oriented techniques Maximizing the technology today in a thirty-five to fifty thousand dollar machine should be able to keep up with you scanning super fast all seventeen points of the S-step protocol or similar uh, within five minutes or less. I can personally do it within two minutes or less, um, it, but that takes time and it takes practice and takes focus. But it's just manuality, right? Like anything else. So if you focus and time yourself to do it, you can do that. Or you know, consider your local mobile sonographer or the best sonographer in your practice. At some point in the past, yours truly included, all started somewhere else. You know, started wondering whether the bladder had a stone or was that just stool in the colon that was really hard and pushing on the bladder. You know, it, it, those are, and we all start somewhere, right? Um, we all have made, as clinical sonographers, every mistake possible. And I have learned from every one of them. And if you haven't, then there's no sense being out there because you're gonna make mistakes. It's gonna happen. It's important to be conscientious about every error and not make the mistake again and learn from it. And this is one reason I've written this article and I'm here with this podcast to continually teach clinical sonography and discuss all the entities around the process. Benefit from all the errors I, errors I and my un anonymized colleagues have made and even that I made as a seven semi-seasoned sonographer and then as a seasoned one, um, you know, it, take advantage of this, right? Because there's no reason you should be able to, or you should have to make the errors that we have if you follow these recommendations. I've made the area errors intrinsically inherent within the recommendations that I give. The S-step protocol, for example, is made to avoid making all the errors that I have or my colleagues have. You know, it's an internationally influenced protocol, right? The technology of today allows us to move through that protocol really fast. And so this, this podcast is not made to be a, um, a promotion for the S-step protocol for Sonopath, but we just know that we created the protocol for a reason, uh, and, and this is it. Telemedicine. It's extremely rare that coming off a single educational seminar, you'll be scanning perfectly. There are vast levels of ability uh, to interpret ultrasound image sets, right? So it's a combination of, of, of those things. The better the image sets, the better the interpretation, the meatier your report's gonna be, right? And so you want to strive to get the best image set out there so your specialist can uh, really dig his, her, his or her teeth into the, into the case and give you what you need that you're looking for. And where do I take that patient, right? So you need support by a company that's interpreting the images and a scanning protocol that will work to your benefit, right? You should ask yourself as a clinical sonographer and also ask your telemedicine company these questions. How is my image quality, right? Are they gonna develop a relationship with you to help you get better? What am I missing and why am I missing it? Does my report reflect the level of sonography I intend to practice, right? Does your report represent you well from image quality to completeness of the description? Am I learning from the report and the process that I am employing it? Is this process making me a better veterinarian or a better technician? Most of all, am I confident in the findings? Because it's your reputation, 
right? Mrs. Smith wants Fido to be taken to the direct direction Fido needs to to become normal Fido again, right? And depends on you, Dr. Dr. Jones, to utilize every, all your abilities to make that happen, right? So in the end, it's your name on the line, right? And so you want to maximize the process, the quality of the process in order to ensure that you are right every time. And there are services that only read still images and, um, and don't want videos because they take longer to interpret and occupy more bandwidth and more storage space. Now, I think this is trending away because technology of today allows us to do video clips much more rapidly uh, and, and, uh, than they have in the past. However, video protocols are exponentially including more information on all the organs and everything adjacent to it and between organs. So you need to see what goes into an organ, what comes out of the organ. You need to see the full organ over three seconds because every three second video contains 120 roughly still images. So if you're sending a set of still images in 34 still, 30 to 40 still images, as opposed to 20, 25 videos, there's a vast difference in image content in order to make that decision of where that animal needs to go. A complete S-step scan or equivalent protocol contains about 20 to 40 videos on average and a few stills for measurement purposes. Doing the math and assuming image quality equal between image sets and video-based protocols, which do you want to interpret or which uh, format do you want your interpretation to come from? Which image set? A pile of still images or a pile of videos where you can make every still image that you want out of that three second video? Do you prefer to risk your cost of missing a lesion on 30 to 40 still image protocols or 30 to 40 properly placed video clips that would give you about 3,600 to 4,800 still images in one study? If I were getting myself scanned, I would want the latter, not the former. So moreover, a video employed protocols such as S-Step or equivalent allows for more fluid scan, saves us from time tons of time as opposed to traditional stop, still image, save it, move on to the next one, scan it, find the image, save it, or uh, uh, freeze it and save it and so forth. Do you remember those protocols? I learned on those protocols. That's why I got away from them, you know? And, and the other thing is when you have video protocols and you're not seeing what you think you need to see, the interpreting specialist can see it. So if you're sweeping through that left adrenal gland in an isoechoic fashion where everything's blending in and you think you're in the right spot, chances are the specialist is going to see it in a video, but they can't in a still, right? So in regard to interpreting specialists available in veterinary medicine, there's a recent ACVR FD standardization that states interpretation, the standardization protocol, which I mentioned in, in hour one of this podcast, Interpret the, the quote from that article, uh, that publication in VetRad and Ultrasound. It says, interpretation at the time of the examination being for, performed by a board certified radiologist, therefore considered to be the gold standard. Well, yeah, I, I can tell you this, this blew up the non-radiology specialist community <laughs> pretty rapidly. My phone was getting blown up with text messages and so forth because Sonographers and referring veterinarians will find rapidly that in reality, this is not and never will be possible to make sure that to have a radiologist read every ultrasound examination. You can barely get radiologists to read radiographs in the CT. And, and sonograms have a vast number of ultrasound image sets being created and sent to telemedicine companies constantly. It, you just can't, it's just lack of reality. It just can't happen in the real world. Ideally, yes, ultrasound falls under the radiology realm. But the good thing is that many AVMA recognized boarded specialists that have many years of experience in clinical sonography and scan every day and have for many, many years and interpret telemedicine every day. They're all available to interpret image sets with an approach and emphasis on their specialty, such as ACVIM, such as ABVP, such as VEX. So if you want internal medicine or practitioner approach that's been, that's scanned and cut and, and, and uh, performed internal medicine uh, type of practice or VEX that's doing emergency critical care, you want that sort of angle on your, your ultrasound image set, then you have that ability to do so. 
you know, and if you can find radiologists to read them, great. You want a radiologist, great. I, I, I am a big advocate of everybody sending the specialty that they want that gives them the answer because in the end, it's on you whether you're taking that animal to the right place or not. Okay. With this specialist spectrum availability, a sonographer and referring clinician can select which type of interpretation to have. And, and that's a good thing. That's a great thing. That's a great thing about the reality of today. You know, but just know that 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 wording's out there in the ACVR FD consensus statement on uh, complete sonogram of the abdomen. Screen size and resolution. This is a quick one. Um, always take the screen resolution and screen size into consideration. Even when you're just investigating over the internet, um, look at look at what's the screen resolution of the machine that you're looking at. Right? Don't even try it if it doesn't have a high screen resolution. For some reason. The best to good enough category in the 35 to 50 K range and everything below manufacturers, for some reason, a lot of them do not spend money on high resolution screens. And I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. It, it, you want the best resolution possible. Screen resolution is crucial. Just look at your old Mac from seven years ago and your current Mac Pro retinal display. It's, it's a totally different ballgame, right? So uh, one, when you're practicing and looking at the screen resolution, you should stand about an arm's length away from the screen and be able to see everything that you're used to seeing. So you should, I like to use adrenal glands as a good sentinel organ to look after. In cat or dog, adrenal glands, they should jump on the screen. Okay, if you're using a machine, let's even take a small dog, take a Yorkie or a, or a Schnauzer or one of those breeds that are easy to find adrenal glands and it should jump on the screen and have three machines sitting there. Try them on each of the machine, same settings and so forth and see which one you like. You shouldn't have to squint at things to look at. So even have your technician say, hey, tell me when I'm squinting right when you're when you're when you're looking it's like if you're squinting that means you're going to squint all day long every scan for the next seven years eight years that you have that machine because the screen resolution isn't what it is or the machine is not producing the image that you want right so consider 15 to 18 inch monitors on the machine and 1920 to by 1080 screen resolution that's the gold standard right now and the best to good enough and if you don't have that you're gonna struggle. That factor in image resolution is going to be compromised right from the start. Every little technological factor that favor that that uh, that you put in your favor adds up into the image quality. So maximize each one of these factors and you will have a great experience. Ultrasound nobology and workflow. Again, I mentioned I, I don't like I personally don't like touch screens. If you like touch screens, great, but time yourself. As you work through the scan, you annotate, you, you save images, all that kind of stuff. Time it and see how much time you're actually spending on the novology. Um, and do what works best for you. But ask yourself, how long does it take me? Compare machines on workflow. There are machines that'll take 10 steps to get where you need to go and others that'll take five. Well, you multiply that times five or six or seven cases a day, that adds up very quickly, right? And this is an often overlooked issue, but I can tell you somebody who's been scanning high volume for a long time, it, it makes a big difference on you know how many steps I have to take to to work through my knobology workflow. When there's poorly designed knobology, as opposed to finely designed efficient knobology, in which you don't even think about it. I think knobology is like accounting. You shouldn't have to think about your bill. It should just get paid. You know, knobology should just work through it, and it shouldn't be painful. If it is painful and you're trying to figure out, okay, am I, what am I doing here? Do I push this button? Do I put that button? You know, and it takes me 10 to 12 steps to finish. It, it's frustrating. It, it, your fingers feel like, you feel like your fingers are doing a bad ballroom dance or, or a bad line dance. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, you're always a step behind. You're bumping into somebody, you're stepping on toes. You know, so personal experience in both sonography and short-lived ballroom and line dancing aside, uh, I can tell you that Poor knobology workflows translate into some time lost and frustration gained. So look at that knobology. Image transmission. So you do your scan, you have your S-step or similar protocol together, and then you need to send it. You can send it to yourself, for example, or send it to tell your telemedicine service as a test case and to ask them, how heavy is my file? You know, and, and so Image quality is paramount. You have to spend adequately to run with a machine that's going to be viable day in and day out from thin ferret to overweight, overweight 
Rottweiler, um, abdomen to heart, the thyroid to cruciate. Okay, but you want a machine that's capable of high resolution and rapid workflow. So the higher the resolution, what has happened is that translates into larger file size. So companies that make these ultrasound machines, there are those that pay attention to compression and other things that go into making a higher resolution scan manageable from a file size standpoint. It should be around 500 megabytes, roughly. And it may be seven, maybe 300, um, but it shouldn't be a gigabyte, it shouldn't be two gigabytes, and certainly shouldn't be three gigabytes, because those can barely be pulled down on in the telemedicine infrastructure, right? Especially if you're in a remote place and you only have 40, 40 down, you know, it, it, on, on your internet uh, bandwidth, um, it's gonna be a problem, right? So what happens when you try to move a one or two or three gigabyte file around the internet, whether if your bandwidth is slow or the receiving bandwidth is slow, is slow or the in, in between is slow? It blocks up, your bandwidth can't keep up with it, your connectivity drops off, you have to resend the case, it eats up a bunch of time, and you have to double check it, make sure that it went through, you don't know if it did or not. This is all time consumption, right? And it all just goes back to do your homework on transmissibility of your machine to avoid this problem. And then if the file size is two or three gigabytes or even a gigabyte and a half, I can tell you telemedicine specialist isn't gonna be happy because they're trying to pull down you know, 10, 15, 20 cases and you've got one that just keeps falling off, right? And so you don't want, you don't want to upset your telemedicine specialist. They're trying to go to bat for you here. You know? and, and so you wanna be able to have an inherent workflow that works for you to limit the time and frustration that you could create if you don't do that homework. Missing lesions. So clinically, if we're just dealing with a standard pancreatitis or a cholangia hepatitis, a gastroenteritis or a global mass of the spleen or the liver, um, and a lesser machine could probably cover these general things. However, I can tell you, if you go through our daily telemedicine archive, these global pathologies are just a small aliquot of pathology that we see coming across the probe every day. The more subtle presentations are actually more frequent than the global ones. And if you don't have a machine that will image it, if you don't have a process that you apply to maximize your image sets, then your cost of missing a lesion increases exponentially. And what's the cost of that to you? So if we consider the pathologies that enter our veterinary facilities on a daily basis, if we just focus directly on an ultrasound machine that we choose and utilize day in and day out in the instructional process involved in clinical sonography, then we take image quality first and foremost into consideration to see both the subtle and the global pathologies in every case, or be confident that we performed a complete lesion-free sonogram, we can honestly tell without hesitation to the pet owner, it's a negative sonogram. Therefore, the problem is elsewhere, right? For example, a cat with pancreatitis can have a half to one centimeter lesion responsible for its clinical presentation. That lesion can be subtle and it can be isoechoic. And if it's not recognized on lower resolution, it's just guesswork clinically at that point. But if you have adequate resolution, then you're gonna see the hypoechoic and ill-defined fat and deviations from curvilinear patterns if you have a software that's gonna differentiate the pancreas from the mesentery, you know, as opposed to just blend through. You know? And if you use a video clip to blend into that structure and out of that structure, it's going to be more recognizable both by you and your telemedicine specialist or whoever's overreading it. So that's just a, an example, but I could talk about that same thing with common bile duct tumors, to, med, to intestinal lesions, uh, to uh, liver lesions, especially iso to slightly hypoechoic nodules in the liver, especially in cats, or, or a, uh, a bile duct calculus, for example, that can just blend right through, gastric ulcers, phrenic vein invasions, uh, uh, small adrenals in Ad Addisonian patients, right? Um, so those are, you know, if you don't have good resolution, you're not going to see an Addisonian adrenal, I assure you. Pelvic urethra tumors, those are isoechoic to surrounding fat. You can blow right by them if you don't have adequate resolution. So it's crucial to have resolution, bottom line. These types of lesions are what walks through your door, whether you know it or not. So now you got to think, well, how many lesions I'm missing on a daily basis, right? 
I always tell everyone from day one, start your clinical sonography curve, capturing high-end views, even if you don't recognize the structures, get the structures around them and then learn to recognize them. But if you don't capture the video clip going through the adrenal glands or going through the common bile duct or going through the pylorus, then you can't go and look at them. You have to capture them, put them in your hard drive so either you or your overeating specialist can look at them. In sum, the sonographer and overeating specialist have to work symbiotically, right? And video loops allow that. Otherwise, you know, the, the, the collaboration is there to minimize your cost of missing a lesion. Think of the political sequence that happens from that point of missing a lesion. Think of the pet's clinical concern. Think of the pet owner conversations involved. I remember when I was a GP, I, I, I despised a, a conversation with a pet owner that didn't go in a nice, smooth, corrective manner, right, or definitive manner. Everything else was just painful, right? And you live that every day. Imagine the conversations and relationships with colleagues in and out of your facility that go along with missing a lesion, right? The, the elephant in the room, right? So think of the time and the financial expense up to that point in the case workup without a correct and definitive diagnosis. Imagine that pancreatitis, quote unquote, that's treated for three days and still not doing right. And it's actually a perforating mucosal or it's lymphoma masking as pancreatitis, which happens all the time, or as a pancreatic abscess. And now the new level of intervention needs to take place, but the owners already spent their money that they can afford on that patient over three days when we could have got to the answer on day one. Or let's say that the, those lesions are missed, you know, and, and, and so it's the same thing, right? So imagine a second opinion colleague that images and diagnoses the missed lesion, and then the repetitive above issues that occur over and over and over again around that facility, or around that, that lesion, or that facility that missed the lesion. Hopefully it won't be yours. But this is the reality I'm trying to help you avoid when considering an ultrasound pur purchase, training, support, telemedicine. It's all connected. It's not just buy a machine, buy a box, start scanning. There's so much more to it. I've been on both sides of this equation, as you can imagine. I've consulted endless, with endless colleagues through scenarios on both sides of the scenario of missing a lesion and how do I address this? I'm seeing this, but the colleague didn't. What do I do? And I always teach them to play the high road. There's always an explanation that you can help your colleague with, right? Elevate your clinical sonography process to optimize the first scan in order that further imaging confirms what you scanned and confirms what you found as opposed to the opposite scenario where somebody else is evidencing the cost of you missing a lesion. I would hope that all colleagues support each other professionally on both sides of this issue, because that's a strict policy in our circles, because nobody was born perfect. Nobody was born a perfect sonographer. We have all made mistakes. We all continue to make mistakes. We try to minimize them. But why not maximize the ability to image all lesions in the cavity scan and minimize your cost of limiting or a cost of missing a lesion the first time. So here are some quick questions to ask yourself and ponder when you're about to evaluate your current machine. It's like a checklist, right? Let's check some boxes. Whether you're evaluating your current machine on whether it's good enough and do I need to upgrade or maybe you're purchasing a new one and you're running simultaneous trials on the same patients, which I strongly recommend. Examine your clinical sonography and your telemedicine workflow personally and in the environment that you're scanning it. Number one, is your preset correct and are you using the right probe, right? This should be taught to you by the support people with the distributor that you're purchasing or eventually purchasing your machine from. They should support you ad nauseum because they want you to get it right. Is the preset optimized for that size patient? Are you using high frequency on a big animal, which you shouldn't? Or are you using low frequency on a thin pancake cat? You know, high frequency with adequate depth penetration to readily image the organ or region that you want. That's what you're shooting for. You want the highest frequency with adequate depth. And make sure you see the whole depth of the abdomen. And remember, the, crani the cranial part of the abdomen is deeper than the collar part. So you're, as you move cranially in the abdomen, you're going to be increasing your depth and the ability of the machine to penetrate that depth. So you wanna see if the machine can cut it with the depth of that animal, scan subxiphoid or intercostal 
and see if it scans that whole organ, the whole liver, all the way to the diaphragm and a centimeter or two beyond. Have the various presets and respective probes been tested over many patients before they're implemented and sent to you? This should be a support mechanism from your distributor. Is your monitor size at least 15 to 18, 18 inches? Is your screen resolution at least 1920 by 1080? Is the processor strong enough to move through the adrenal gland in a three second video without pixelating the images? Okay, so this is important. If it starts to pixelate as you're scanning through, then your processor is not adequate. That's a hardware issue. It's a get what you pay for scenario. Is the acoustic power strong enough with the correct frequency, low frequency probe to image cleanly an intercostal liver of 140 pound newfie, right? How does the software look? This is number eight. How does the software look? Does the software allow you to see curvilinear patterns between tissues? So you can contrast mesentery from pancreas, pancreatic duct from mesentery, spleen from liver, which is very important as you can imagine. These are essential to not missing lesions. You never want to call a splenic tumor, a liver tumor, a liver tumor, a splenic tumor. Imagine the sequelae after that. Oh, it's a big liver tumor. No, it's a splenic tumor. Okay, surgeon will be happy, just has to do a splenectomy. Or no, no, it's a splenic tumor, but it's actually a liver tumor. Surgeon gets in there, doesn't like doing liver tumors, and somebody's going to grumble, right? This has to do with the software being able to demonstrate the separation of the splenic capsule from the hepatic capsule and the infrastructure of both organs that are different. And if you don't have software that does that, stop there, okay? Or you may not see inflammation associated with a gallbladder mucosal if you don't have adequate contrast in your software and it just blends in. Same discussion as the pancreatitis, you know, where soft images make you want to give pancreatitis to everything. So these interpretations or lack of them defines the pet as an urgent surgical gallbladder or not in the case of an inflamed gallbladder mucosal. If the image is too soft, you can't distinguish, distinguish the surrounding fat from the gallbladder, okay? And you can't distinguish the common bile duct in the midst of that inflammation. Ask yourself also, how's the color flow? How's the power Doppler? Is it weak and easily distorts or is it nice and fluid and you can see the vascular tree in different organs? I like to use the kidney, for example. You should have nice and clean power Doppler because Doppler is the most sensitive modality when you're talking about image resolution. So you might have a nice image, get your clean image first, then put the power Doppler or the regular color flow Doppler on and you should see nice, fluid, pulsating vascular tree, okay? Um, if the settings are correct and if the machine is capable of it. But if you have any sort of acoustic interference, Doppler is the first one to not be clean, right? So Doppler is kind of that really sensitive uh, modality that you have to have a clean image and good acoustic penetration to make the Doppler clean. So these factors are crucial. I like to use the adrenal gland again as my sentinel image, the common bile duct, pelvic urethra, ileocecal lymph nodes. These are all good sentinel organs or uh, structures to look at when you're when you're testing different machines side by side you know and you need to image a pancake cat and a fat cat you need to image a small dog an overweight beagle uh you know and use that as your sentinel and then move to like a, a 90 pound uh, uh 90 pound labrador and then you know have a rottweiler that you sedate and, and try that or lightly sedate give them a little body tension because body tension is steals acoustic power as well, right? So typically the, the smaller high res, the smaller or smaller animals and the very large tense animals and thick skinned animals, those are the ones that really challenge the machine. So all of these things come into playing a role in the cost of missing a lesion. It's just physics, it's technology, it's clinical support behind the machine, and, and, and it's a get what you pay for. So the last thing to look at is what's the cost of your staff time? So to review, imagine if your time is not optimized with the use of the machine and all the factors that I've mentioned. Are your workflow steps minimized to save you time? Or are you doing a bad ballroom dance with the machine workflow? 
Is your transmiss transmissibility of the case streamlined? Is the case size roughly 500 megabytes? Is it moving across the, the internet? Or is it hanging up in the process? Because imagine doing that five to 10 times a day. Technicians can become optimal sonographers, and we have proven that. I have nine of them in the field, and they all scan as well as I possibly could hope. So in sum, when buying an ultrasound machine, and this concept applies to CT and DR as well, what's your cost of missing a lesion? Think about it. Think about what happens when you miss a lesion and you're not correct on your first opinion and it goes somewhere else and it doesn't bode well. It doesn't bode well for you, for you professionally, it doesn't bode well for the facility in which you work, your reputation within the four walls of the facility and outside of it. And most of all, it doesn't bode well for the patient, which is opposite of the outcome that we desire with respect to the reason we all went into veterinary medicine in the first place. It's to get to the answer and enhance that patient's quality of life, if possible. Evaluate the cost of missing the lesion with respect to your patient, your pet owner, your time, your team's time, your image and your report footprint, your reputation, and most of all, the cost of missing a lesion ultimately affects your art of veterinary medicine that you and your team have so painstakingly dedicated yourself to all these years, just like I have and just like my colleagues have. Because we're in it for the right reason, right? So you're not doing yourself a justice if you don't go through these steps, which may seem painstaking. However, they will serve you for the next seven, eight years of the life of, the, life of your machine. Then once you've done that, you've thought about all these factors, look at these steps and knock off this checklist. Machine purchase checklist. Do your ultrasound economics. Remember an ultrasound exam costs the owner, sonographer, technician, telemedicine cost. Take those three factors, the sonographer, technician, telemedicine cost, and multiply it times the number of scans per month times nine months. For example, a $400 exam fee to a pet owner minus $150 of operational costs, leaves you a $250 net revenue times 20 scans a month, is $5,000 a month times nine months, it's 45 grand a year in revenue. This is based on a one doctor practice. So imagine, and, and very conservative numbers, right? And so at, at five scans a week, that you should be doing five scans a day if you have five sick patients a day. Or maybe you have 10 sick patients a day and you five of them say yes to an ultrasound but I bet you can market it. If you believe in it, your pet owner believes in it. So do the math first and then select your machine price point and get the best machine you can to be ahead of the learning and professional clinical sonography curve. Maybe your numbers make sense to buy a $90,000 machine. Go for it. You don't have to settle for the best of good enough. We play in the best of good enough sandbox. So that's, that's why I use that as the example. It's the most popular higher end machine is in the 35 to 50 K range, but you can get, you can spend, if your numbers make sense to buy 70 or 90 K worth of machine, go right to it. Clinical sonographer selection. Number two, checkbox. Look at that person regarding desire, time allotment. Does this person have time to go through this, uh, learning curve, focus, dedication, longevity of employment. Is this a, is this a person that is, as you know, is looking out the door to the next clinic or possibly moving in the next six months? You don't want to invest all this time and energy into somebody that's going to leave. You know, you can, uh, you, you, uh, practice owners out there, there there's a non-compete that you could put around that. You know, if you're going to spend the money on that sonographer getting educated and buying the machine and all the rest, you want that person around. And sonographer, you want to ensure that your, your practice owner is going to be confident that you're not going anywhere. It goes both ways, right? So, but you have to be able to allot the time, your two hours a day, your one hour a day to scan until you're really solid. All right. Um, education type and facility. Okay. Choose that. Number three, on-site live virtual is available now or downloadable CE where you work on your own time. What works best for you? Machine cost, of course. What does your calculation tell you you can buy? Screen size, 15 to 18 inches, 1920 by 1080 resolution or better. Software appearance. Can you readily distinguish tissues one from the other? Far field image quality. Does everything look diagnostic at 6 to 12 centimeters of depth? Does the image pixelate on fast sweeps? 
Have I tested all the body types from a pancake cat to an overweight Rottweiler? And everything in between, car and heart, abdomen, thyroid, parathyroid, plus or minus orthopedic. Now biology and image transition work or transmission workflow. How efficient is it, right? Are you supported? How are you supported by your distributor? What's the warranty? Okay, warranties, forgot to talk about those. I think I talked about it in the first hour, but I'll talk about it again. If a machine works well and it's solid, it shouldn't need a warranty. That should be on the manufacturer. If you didn't, presi- you didn't produce a machine, if, if you produce a machine that's not gonna break down, then you don't need a warranty, right? And, and that's, that's the way I look at it as being a consumer for so long. So, you know, service contracts, what often happens is you're sold on the machine and then when you're ready to sign it on the line, the salesperson may throw in, oh, do you need a service contract with that? It's like, service contract? Oh yeah, we're gonna give you the first one, first year for free, but second year it's gonna cost you three grand a year. So multiply that times four years, five years being the lifespan of the machine. So now you're paying an extra 12 grand for a machine that you already decided on, right? I've been there, done that, unfortunately, but I only did it once. Because I personally, when I, when I had machines that, that had a service contract involved, I just didn't buy the service contract. I put a fund aside and I bought a la carte if anything went wrong. Unfortunately, that particular machine had a lot of things went wrong, but I still made out on the positive end as opposed to a service contract. But you make your own choice, own choice on that, whether you want a service contract or not. But that's coming from, you know, and, but uh, there are a couple of companies out there that have service contracts built in that don't cost you anything. So, but again, ask how you're supported, right? Seek out references, go on to social media. There, there are mobile sonographer groups. There are sonographer groups out there. Um, ask your mobile sonographer, but not just one. And don't bother calling the person that the distributor gives you as a reference. Because that person's naturally gonna tell you, yeah, the, machine, the machine's great, everybody loves, I love everybody there, blah, 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 blah. They're all gonna tell you that, otherwise they wouldn't be available for the phone call, right? So do your own homework, ask around, ask multiple colleagues, ask your colleagues from, from, from the university, from your, from your local association. Hey, do you have an ultrasound machine? What machine do you use? Do you like it? Blah, blah, blah. Do your own homework. Otherwise, it's your cost of missing a lesion. Veterinary facility culture, if it's sick, it needs a probe. Accept no less and demonstrate the results of this concept and culture within your staff and your shelter pets first time. Use your staff pets, just start scanning your staff pets. I have a colleague that did that and it, it just blew up her, her, in a good way, it blew up her sonography practice because now the staff believes, believes in it because they see the results of what you're doing and then they will tell the clients. And they live, if it's sick, it needs a probe and go around the clinic saying, yeah, it's sick, it needs a probe. You know, that's what you want. That's the culture that you want and that will fuel your whole process. And the bottom line is, I know I'm long-winded. I believe in what we do. Uh, we are structured around these concepts here at Sonopath. This is why we do it, okay? This is what gets us out of bed, blows our hair back every day. And so the bottom line is number 13, checkbox, enjoy your art of veterinary medicine. Have fun doing what you do every day because know that you're doing the right thing and you're getting it done right. And then you can go home and be satisfied with your day. And, and we want to support you in that. Anything you need, in the clinical sonography realm at all, or if you have any questions or feedback on this podcast that we're starting, info at sonopath.com. We're always here for you. Check us out on YouTube and all the social media venues. We're here for you. Anyway, have a great day and hope your veterinary day blows your hair back. Have a good time at it.